Welcome, everybody, to episode nine of Black and Gold Weekly. It's hard to believe it's episode nine already. We are getting pretty deep into the NHL season, and it's been a uh, it's been a pretty good, eventful season so far for the Boston Bruins, who are sitting atop the East Division. As you can see, I am joined by a very special guest here today, making a return to the show here on Black and Gold Weekly. It is Shannon Walsh from the Slapshot Sweethearts podcast. Shannon, thank you so much for being here and uh, really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Yeah, thanks for having me back. It's been a crazy few weeks since first time we chatted, so glad to hop back on. Yeah, for sure. Boston's had a lot going on, uh, particularly, you know, the big news this past week was the Lake Tahoe game and uh, that was a huge game for the Bruins and a huge game for the NHL as well uh, as the TV ratings come in. They have to be pretty happy with that. Uh, but Shannon is from the Slapshot Sweethearts podcast. If you guys haven't heard of them or checked them out yet, definitely, definitely do so. Twitter, YouTube, uh, all your favorite pod cl- podcast platforms, they are on it all and they do fantastic content. So you are definitely going to want to check them out. Definitely uh, becoming... Some of my favorite hockey minds to uh, to listen to and talk to here in the uh, the hockey media universe, I guess we could call this. But uh, before we get into the show here, plenty to talk about with Boston. But I want to just mention the links down in the description of this video first. Boston Bruins Apparel, top link, NHL Apparel, middle link, and NCAA College Apparel down in the third link. Uh, If you are in the market for any of those things, whether it's hats, t-shirts, jerseys, sweatpants, accessories, all kinds of stuff, we have it all for you. Just click one of those three links, whatever you're looking for, and uh, it would really help out Black and Gold Productions here a lot, Um, which... uh, This show is in partnership with Black and Gold Productions, so I want to give a huge thank you to Mark Allred and everyone at BNG Productions for their support and allowing this show to take place. And, you know, they're the reason that this happens every week. So, uh, Shannon, if you're ready to uh, get into things here, we're just going to start with a big story. Lake Tahoe, what a game for the Boston Bruins. Yeah, I hadn't even sat down on my couch yet, and they had scored a goal 34 <laughs> seconds in. I thought I had yeah. time to chow down dinner, and the goal horn was already going off. I mean, they came to to play before the sun could even go down. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny because uh, I had talked earlier, and we had talked on another show about how outdoor games are generally on the lower scoring yeah. side. Um, and then we have a goal like 30 seconds into the game and it it was two, two at the end of the first period. I'm like, well, so much for low scoring and, uh, ends up being a, you know, Boston really kind of took over in the second period at the end there. And that was, that was it. The the game was over at that point, but a lot of goals scored and it was a big showing for the Bruins. Obviously David Poshnok's hat trick was huge. Um, they got offense from other people as well that, it was really nice to see them get on the scoreboard. I mean, McAvoy, whenever he scores a goal, that's big. Trent Frederick gets his first career goal. That was awesome. Um, it was it was just a really good performance for the Bruins and something that they needed because they hadn't been playing all that well heading into that game. So uh, do you think that this is something that could kind of shift the momentum back into Boston's favor going forward? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of really good parts about it. Obviously, Pasternak's uh, hat trick is always going to kickstart the rest of the guys and the rest of the team. Mm-hmm. And obviously seeing those young guys get first career goals and things like that is really exciting. And the atmosphere of outside really excites people. And I think mm-hmm. that especially the guys on the team, they're showing up in those nineties outfits, like that's <laughs> yes. already getting them excited, getting the, they're playing Barbie girl in the locker room. Like they're really yeah. in their own zone. And I really hope that they can keep that momentum going when they have to go play another regular ice game and it's not just a fluke of going outside and i was particularly surprised like we talked before we started recording about how they had four days off going to that game there could have been a lot of rust there and i'm worried now going into another three or four days off that playing the islanders uh they might islanders and rangers respectively they might you know start to get a little rusty and that momentum might slow a bit i hope it doesn't but i mean there's a lot of potential there for that yeah, definitely. That is something I worry about looking in uh, ahead a little bit to Thursday and Friday night where, you know, they've had another pretty decent break of time with without playing a game. And that's kind of 
Overall, so far this season, Boston, for the most part, other than Sunday, haven't done well when they've had those long breaks. Like they've always come back rusty, but um, Sunday they were able to avoid that. And I think the whole atmosphere of it all does play a big role in that. Like, how do you not get up for a outdoor game? Well, maybe you could ask Carter Hart and he would have an answer <laughs> to that question. But how how are you not like ready to go for an outdoor game like that? Boston, I was worried because they played so bad on Thursday against the Devils last week. And um, we'll have to touch on that in a little bit because I don't even want to talk about that game. But um they, they were playing so poorly heading into it. I was worried, but they just came out ready to go. And like this team, this team just feels like such a team. Like I think a little bit more than the past few years where like, like then all the 90s outfits and like they just they're yeah. having so much fun together. And I feel like this team really has gelled well and gets along in the locker room and is like, not that other teams haven't, but there's something about this team that just yeah. feels different where like these guys are thoroughly enjoying being together and trying to make the most out of this season. Yeah. And I think the last time I was on, we did talk a lot about how this season was, obviously it was much earlier. I think it was like the first week of the season. Mm -hmm. And I think we talked a lot about how it was make or break for this year or two before they would have to go into a rebuild. And I kind of want to retract that because I think that even though they are playing great, if they don't win a cup this year, I don't think it's make or break. I think these guys really do, like you said, have uh, gelled really well together. Mm -hmm. There is a ton of potential on the defense that I was not at all expecting. Yeah. They went into Lake Tahoe with injuries and bringing up guys from the taxi squad that I was like, well, we're screwed. Like, even though it wasn't <laughs> scoring game yeah. the I mean goalies uh, it's surprising to me that outdoor games aren't more high scoring because goalies are sitting there with sun in their eyes mm -hmm. and like are already at a disadvantage and I mean our defense was at a disadvantage as well and we put up or they put up a couple goals against us but our defense is holding their own way more than I was expecting and I feel like that's something that is I mean it's getting a fair amount of discussion but it's always like when's it gonna crack when's it gonna crack and it hasn't yet so yeah, no, they have a lot of young talent up and, up and coming into this lineup. And Erho Vakanainen made his season debut uh, on Sunday in that game. And he pl ended up playing, like, I think it was 22 or 23 yeah. minutes in that game as, like, first game of the year, just called up from Providence. And and you uh, you play 20-something minutes. And you're you ha he had a really good game, too. Like, he looked good yeah. out there. He was um, actually, when we had Dale Arnold on in our separate, second episode, mm -hmm. we were talking, it was a season preview for the Bruins, and Dale, we asked Dale who he thought uh, for training camp was going to be, like, the prospect that Cassidy really wanted to see, you know, shine and make his impact on the roster. And that was Dale's pick, was Yerho Vakaninen. And yep. then, like, two days later, after we posted the episode, he got put down in Providence. But uh, So I was excited to see him go up for Lake Tahoe. And like you said, he played like 23 minutes and he had a really good game. And I was like, maybe <laughs> maybe that sentiment wasn't entirely wrong. It was just going to take a bit longer than training camp. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, Boston's got such a – well, when they're healthy, they have such a large number of defensemen who are kind of in the running for those bottom pair spots. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you've got Lausanne healthy and Grizzlick and – Miller and you know uh, Moore and Clifton and now you've got Vaca Nine into the mix. There's a lot of defensemen there who are yeah. kind of fighting for a couple of spots. So it is hard to get into the lineup. Unfortunately, the injury bug has hit hard, um, and we'll we'll go into a little bit more depth in that in a, in a few minutes here. But um, Vaca Nine had to step into a role because so many other guys are out. And he took advantage of it and played really, really well. And now with Lausanne out for at least the next month, it yeah. looks like Vakaninen's probably here to stay and hopefully can continue playing at that level. Yeah, and I think it's a huge opportunity, especially as some of the other top teams in the East are kind of slumping. And it mm -hmm. looks like we're, we're, at least from the Lake Tahoe momentum, kind of going back up and getting into our own again. So if these young guys can keep gelling, and I don't know if you have to play Barbie girl every single game, I don't <laughs> if they can keep that momentum going, it, it'll be great for those young guys. And I would rather see a competition on who stays and who has to go to Providence than who mm -hmm. are we going to call up and who can actually fill the hole. Yeah, 100%. It's a good problem to have when you have that many yeah. players good enough to play at the NHL level. That's a really good problem to have as far as your team depth goes. And, uh, I feel like Barbie Girl probably should become the, the win song now. Usually teams have a song that they play in the locker room after every win. Uh, I feel like that's got to be Barbie Girl for the Bruins now after the Poshnok interview. 
It was just such a, I mean, it fit the the theme of the game. I just, as soon as I saw that on Twitter, I was like, wow, that's a blast from. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was funny. And like pasta coming out with the pink sunglasses on and like, yeah, he was, it, it, his. I love his accent. His Czech accent is so fun to listen to. He's just yeah. like, yeah, you make me come out and answer questions. They're playing Barbie <laughs> Girl in the locker room, and I'm missing it. He's like, oh, I was, I was dying laughing when I heard that. And I'm like, that's like, that's the feeling I get with this team, which is kind of a little bit different from the past few years, where like this team is having so much fun, and I think Pasternak's a big part of that. Um. But I, I feel like there's there's just something in that locker room where like this team has come together so close and like it, it feels like a really fun team to be a part of. And like everyone's like bought in. Everyone's on the same page. Everyone knows what the goal is here. And they're just all trying to work for it. And they're trying to have an absolute blast along the way, too, and make it as fun as possible. And um I think teams like that generally do better than, you know, obviously teams that maybe are a little tight and are a little bit, you know, kind of forcing it and a little too worried about things where like when you just loosen up and enjoy the game, I think a lot of times pl- certain players, particularly guys like David Poshnok, play a lot better with that kind of attitude around the team. And he's definitely leading the way this season as far as that goes. He's been unbelievable. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's hard to ignore the fact that our our leadership turnover really went into a younger perspective. Obviously, mm-hmm. like Chara moved on, and not that Bergeron is, you know, a spring chicken, but the, yep. <laughs> the younger guys that are taking the A were Car- Brandon Carlo was wearing yep. the A at uh, Lake Tahoe, which was a surprise. I, I thought it should have been Charlie McAvoy, but at any rate, he's still a younger guy on the blue line that's taking it over, and it shows a lot in terms of kind of the culture in the locker room that these younger guys like David Pasternak and like Brad Marchand, who's also not particularly young, but obviously younger than Chara, Chara are taking yep. over. And their personalities are incredibly different than Chara. And their leadership styles are obviously incredibly different as well. And I think even though Chara is one of the best leaders in the league and in league history, it's mm-hmm. an incredibly different culture. And if it works for the younger style for Boston and it keeps these young guys focused and happy and not nervous on the ice, which is exactly what we don't need on the blue line. And it's working right now, then fine. Keep it going. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, I I just, this team to me is so likable. Like it's such a likable team. Like I would want to hang out with all of these guys (laughs) and I feel like it'd be a really fun time. And, and I just, I feel like that's going to be a huge positive for this team if, as long as they, you know, keep that, that energy going. Cause they're, they're an ener- energetic bunch this year. And I think, you know, even a lot of the young guys are a big part of that. I think McAvoy playing a much bigger leadership role this year. Carlo, uh, like you said, he wore the A on Sunday. I was surprised it wasn't McAvoy, but I think that speaks volumes to how Carlo is viewed in that locker room yeah. and how much those guys really do look to him to be kind of a defensive leader there. Um, and it says a lot about how much the Bruins want to keep him around. You yes. know, putting the A on the sweater means a lot for a guy than just saying, like, we, you know, we want you. We were talking about that with Dale Arnold as well. We were like, if they put it on McAvoy, they're really saying, you know, we want to keep you around. Don't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, putting it on Carlo means, like, you're part of the future for this blue line, which says, is great. Yeah, I definitely look at, I feel, Carl, Carlo, McAvoy, and Grizzlick, I think, are kind of those core pieces on that back end now who are going to be the the present and the future of this team. Hopefully, Grizzlick can get healthy because he's had a tough go of it yeah. this year with injury after injury. So next up uh, from Sunday, I just have one question here. Um, what was your favorite moment overall from Sunday? Because there were certainly a lot to choose from that were awesome. Uh, I know what mine is, but uh, what was your favorite moment if you had to pick one? My favorite moment, I mean, I want to say Trent Frederick's first goal, but I didn't see it. I stepped <laughs> away and th- they started rifling off goals. I was changing yeah rooms for to watch in my bedroom and not the living room and I missed three goals so like, <laughs> I mean that's good for them um but I think 
you know, seeing Pasternak come out and just really dominate the game in the first 30 seconds was really, really great to see. Um, and then obviously all the marketing that they did with the mascots was pretty cute too. But uh, in terms of the game itself, just seeing that dominance right off the bat was awesome. Yeah, that first goal, like, I think it was like 34 seconds in or something. It was yeah. so, it was like, wow, what a start to this one. That was definitely a great moment. And then for him to go on and have a hat trick in the game, it's just yeah. like coming full circle like pasta is one of the best goal scorers in the nhl there is no question about it and nobody can deny that at all so big showing for him my my moment was definitely uh trent frederick's first goal like this kid i love this kid so much and he's he was one of my favorite players in providence for the past couple years and for him to come out gets an nhl job this season playing in the bottom six and He's done everything the Bruins have needed him to do. He's been physical. He's he's fought really tough guys in Tom Wilson and Brendan Lemieux, like two of the better fighters in the NHL. He's gone toe-to-toe with them. He's not taken bad penalties. His only penalty minutes all season long are those two fights. That's it. He's got 10 penalty minutes. He has not put the team shorthanded once. But the offense wasn't really like there wasn't a lot of offense there. And that was the one thing missing. And for him to finally get his first goal in that setting of all places, like outdoors on national TV, I thought that was just the coolest thing. And so good for Frederick, who's done so much for this team this year and look looks like a really good young player that I'm looking forward to hopefully being in a Bruins uniform for a long time. To me, that was my favorite moment, just to finally see him put one in the net. Yeah, and I think going back to what we were saying about those young guys, seeing him finally get a goal and that success, it's like when Chara scored his first goal in Washington, like everybody Mm -hmm. just floods in that excitement from all those young guys in the locker room. It's got to be not even just for him, but for all of them. Just so, so exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I I don't know what it's like to score an NHL goal, but (laughs) I have to imagine it's an awesome, awesome feeling. Um, I remember my first high school goal and that doesn't really mean a whole lot, but still, even that was cool for me, like actually scoring in a meaningful game like that for to do that at the NHL level must be absolutely incredible. So awesome for Trent Frederick and uh, awesome game for the Bruins on Sunday. Um, Really needed to see a good showing out of them because of what we're about to talk about next. Uh, But it was big for them to come out and really dominate Philadelphia like that. But Before we move further on, we have to touch on last Thursday's game uh, against the New Jersey Devils, which I don't even really want to talk that much about because that was the worst game for the Bruins this season, in my mind, without a doubt. Like, that was just disgusting to watch. Um, I was furious during that game. They could not even pass the puck. So uh, New Jersey's kind of been an issue this year. They're a team that kind of – has the knows how to play against the Bruins in a way that oftentimes leads to success for them. The similar to how the Islanders have been this season and uh, Bruins have the Islanders coming up again. So we'll talk about that. Um, But as far as New Jersey goes, do you think that was just a bad game? Do you think New Jersey has like some secret formula here? Like they, they can make crabby patties now and and can beat the Bruins or, uh, is this something to worry about for Boston? Like, what just your thoughts on how, like, that game was awful, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, I, for anybody that watches Slap Shot Sweet Hurts, mm-hmm. you know that I think the Devils are a dark horse in the East. Yeah. I think that we're kind of counting them out, and they've only played 14 games versus the 18 that the Bruins have played. And so even though they've lost the last three the, on the devil's side mm-hmm. they've they've beaten the bruins more than once which cannot be counted out in the fact that they've taken all of the that huge break and they did not come back with rust um and i think that you know looking the, at those three losses the they have the same point total if you they've got four games in hand if you calculate yeah. the point total in terms of win percentage they're right up there with the flyers and the capitals and the penguins who are all tied with 21 points right now when we're recording so i mean you can't count them out at all in terms of where they are in the standings and yeah they do have a secret sauce in terms of beating the bruins and i think part of it is that the bruins are like oh they're at the bottom of the east like it's a it's a rest game basically and they stop doing that it's an immature way of thinking Mm -hmm. about any team in any game but they keep doing it with the devils and they did it in the season opener and i remember that's the first time i came on we were like 
well, yeah. you know, we expected to win that game. We expected to come out hot, and that didn't happen. And yeah. now it's happened multiple times now. The Bruins just keep thinking that they can coast all over the Devils, and multiple teams keep doing that. Mm-hmm. And that's not how it's going to go. The Devils keep taking losses to bad teams, not good teams. <laughs> yeah, New Jersey's been a tough team to figure out. Like they're beating good teams, but then they're losing to Buffalo. And I'm right. like, what's going on here? Like, and that worries about that's something I'm worried about with the Bruins because they've tended to do this over the past few years is when they play, they play down to opponents sometimes, yeah. and especially certain opponents. And the Devils this year have definitely been a team that they play down to. And Boston hasn't played Buffalo yet. I'm worried about the Bruins doing that with Buffalo because that's that's another team that has been able to steal wins against them over the past couple of seasons. And like the Bruins should be destroying the Buffalo Sabres. The Bruins should be beating the New Jersey Devils, but they just seem to play down to that competition. And then they end up losing games that they shouldn't be losing. And um, it's kind of something that I'm a little bit worried about going forward because They'll come out and beat the Flyers every time. They'll have three goal comebacks against Washington. And then they go into a game like like New Jersey or Buffalo that they should win and they just completely lay an egg and, and blow it. And it's like what that it's such a frustrating thing with this team, especially, you know, being a fan of them, where it's like, can we please at least beat the teams that we should be beating like almost every time? Yeah, it's incredible. And it's even more frustrating in this season because of the division setup. The week, mm-hmm. we're going to have to keep playing Buffalo, New- the Rangers, yeah. the Devils. And if we have to keep seeing the Rangers without Pan- Panarin and that mm-hmm. we're going to lose to them, I'm going to lose my mind. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to lo- absolutely lose my mind. Or the Sabres, who can't get Jack Eichel in, you know, a playing position. And we're going to lose to them. Like that's not granted. We haven't done it yet, but like with the devils, Jack Hughes is finally coming into his own. That's not good for us. If we can't lose to them when they were still like getting, you know, baby giraffe and trying to walk now that they yep. can walk and we can't win. That's not, it's not good. Yep. Yeah. 100%. Um, it's just, it's one of those frustrating things. It's like win the games that we should win, please, 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 please do that. But I don't know. Boston's just been doing that uh, for the last little while now. They just play down to those teams. It's kind of uh, it's it's kind of annoying, to be honest. It's very annoying as a fan. It's like, c- can we just come out and beat those teams and, and do it handily? Like, they should be beating these teams handily. You're a first-place team in the NHL. You shouldn't be having problems with the Devils and the Rangers and the Sabres and teams like that. But for some reason, Boston t- likes to play down. And hopefully they can uh, get that out of their system and and hopefully fix that as the season goes along here. But that's enough of that New Jersey game. That was just a garbage Mm -hmm. night for the Bruins. And we'll move on because there's a lot of positives to talk about with this team. They're still in first place. Um, They had a huge game on Sunday. It was awesome to see. They've got a big week coming up that I'm excited for to see how they can do. But an unfortunate thing is the injury bug continues to just (laughs) hit this team over and over and over again. So uh, David Krejci missed Sunday's game. Kevin Miller missed Sunday's game. Grizzlick has been out. Lausanne got hurt during Sunday's game. And now we know he's going to be out for at least a month. Uh, Zaboro missed Sunday's game, but I believe should be back for the Islanders game tonight. Um, so getting Zaboro back would be nice because at least we're not down like four or five defensemen. But um, it's it's just, I mean, the injuries keep coming and the Bruins so far have been able to obviously keep winning despite that. But uh, I feel like these injuries, particularly on the back end, you know, having three of your top six defensemen out is not a good situation to be in. Um, do you think the Bruins can sustain winning? You know, do they have the depth to to be able to keep winning and still be a first place team with all of these guys out of the lineup? You know, I think it kind of circles back to how we were talking about Lake Tahoe. The confidence mm-hmm. on the ice, you wouldn't have known they were yeah. missing those guys. They scored seven goals and they didn't have <laughs> David Krejci. Like, yep. great. Like, keep doing that. I mean, I've never thought of David Krejci as the significant impact player that many people do. I mean, he's a very great support player and he's one of the best Bruins that we've had in the last decade. But, I mean, when I hear that he's out, it's more of like, what? How are we going to ignite those, you know, younger guys? Mm-hmm. Not so much like, where's the production going to come from? Yep. And I think same with Kevin Miller. Uh, it's more like, where's that like consistent role player going to come? Not like, 
oh no, David Pasternak's out. Um, and so I think as long as those younger guys can stay gelled and confident and focused, we'll yep. be fine. I don't think that there's necessarily a significant skill gap that we're losing with Krejci. Obviously there's skill and uh, veteran leadership, but like yep. the skill and is not as much, especially with the blue line. Like we said, it's like, who are we going to take up from Providence? Not like, you know, I don't know. It's uh, so, I mean, I'm not that concerned as long as they can maintain their focus and their confidence, but we're going into kind of an awkward stretch of games that I'm mm-hmm. not like completely confident about. Um, if we were playing, you know, the Flyers a couple more times, I'd be fine. <laughs> you know, if we threw yeah. in, in there, I'd be like, whatever. Because they're, you know, opponents were comfortable around. But yep. I am not, you know, loving the Islanders, not loving the Rangers because it should be an easy win, but it's not. We yep. never play stellar around the Capitals. So, yep. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I Boston's shown that they have guys that can step up, especially on that back end, like, I did not want to see John Moore play another game after Thursday night against New Jersey, but he actually had a really good game on Sunday. So if like, if John Moore can at least be a stable defenseman back there, like he's, he's fine in a fill in role where when like right now, when you have so many guys out, I think he can fill in and be a serviceable defenseman. Connor Clifton. I mean, Yes, he he runs around at times, but when Clifton's playing well, he's an effective player, and he brings physicality. He brings some offensive ability. He's a solid skater. Um, I think Clifton's a guy that you can trust. And then the biggest surprise to me was how good Vakaninen was Sunday. I was not expecting him to play that well um, in his first NHL game in a long time. Um, Trying to think, he started the season up in Boston, I think like two years ago now, but then he got sent down and uh, he got injured. He, and then he got sent down and never really made his way back up and play, was playing in Providence for the most of the past couple of years. For him to just step in like that and play that well, and now it looks like with Lausanne out, he's going to play with McAvoy as a pairing. You know, if, if Vaka Nining can keep playing like that, then I'm not overly worried about the defense because it feels like they just have more and more guys that they can just plug in there and, and still get good production out of. Yeah, I actually love the Vaka and McAvoy pair. Oh, yeah. Month. I think that is incredible for his development. For mm-hmm. you know, They can get that comfortable. Honestly, if you can just keep slotting those young guys with McAvoy for like, a month or two and get them, you know, comfortable with themselves and confident on the ice and then move them with somebody else. It's just the, it'll keep supporting consistency. And same with uh, Brandon Carlo. He has been, like we said, so, you know, surprisingly supportive for those mm-hmm. young guys in the blue line that I, I personally wasn't expecting. He didn't even come up in my mind when we were talking about who was going to really step up and make sure that those young guys down on the blue line were going to feel, you know, supported now that Charles, mm-hmm. he didn't, across my mind but he has been significant he got the a like we said so if you can keep just that's the only time i will support line tinkering (laughs) is if he can make sure that each one of those young guys on the blue line is feeling supported and not just you know putting x person on top and then everybody else is just you know make sure no one scores while you're on the ice yeah exactly um yeah, I, I've just, I mean, the leadership of this Bruins blue line now, I mean, Miller's obviously been around a long time and kind of, he he's a tough defensive guy who's come back from some major injuries, but now, you know, it looks like he he's injured again and we don't know what's going to happen long-term there. If he, you know, I'm worried now seeing Miller back on the injury report because, you know, he he's come back from so much, but it seems like it kind of reminds me almost of Alex Smith in the NFL, say, yeah. <laughs> where like if if you get hurt one more time, it's like it feels like kind of that's it. And now Miller's hurt again, and it's like, oh no, is this is this like another major injury? Um, hopefully it's not. Hopefully he's able to come back. But your true leaders on that blue line now are Charlie McAvoy and Brandon Carlo, and these are kids still in their mid twenties. Who who yeah, McAvoy is my age. Like he's not he's young. Yeah, McAvoy's even yeah, Carlo, I think, is a year or two older than McAvoy. And, and McAvoy's only like twenty-three, I think. He's twenty-three. Yeah. Or he just turned twenty-four. His birthday he, was like a month ago. Oh, so he just turned twenty-four. It's like 
that's your leadership on the blue line. And obviously, you know, those guys have stepped up huge this season with Chara gone. And I mean, Carlo's kind of taken over that defensive defenseman role. McAvoy's turning into a Norris Trophy candidate where he's getting it done at both ends of the ice. And these younger guys just seem to be able to step in and play their roles. And I mean, first it was Lausanne next to McAvoy. Now it looks like it's going to be Vaka Nainen for a while and just steps right in and, and they play really well. And I think that's a, a huge, um, uh, 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 like a really great sign for McAvoy and Carlos that they can be leaders at this level at such young ages and yeah. really bodes well for the Bruins blue line going forward because you know now have your core guys that you can build around and know that you're going to be successful building around. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And I think it's – I'm glad you brought up the Alex Smith comparison with Kevin Miller because last night I was uh, with a friend who uh, covers the Washington football team for NBC Sports Washington. And I was mm-hmm. asking because Alex Smith just did an interview saying, you know, they didn't want me when I came back. Obviously, like, I'm, I'm a liability, blah, blah, blah. And he's, he only has – his contract is, you know, coming up. And they yep. just signed – to, not that this is a Washington football team podcast, but <laughs> <laughs> they just re-signed Taylor Heineke to three years. And I was like, what do you think Alex Smith is going to do? You know, like yep. days are numbered. And she was like, well, I hope he retires. You know, he's injury prone. He ended the season hurt. Yeah, uh, He's like, he's made of glass in a lot of people's minds. And that's kind of mm-hmm. how I think of Kevin Miller because he came back from, you know, a less gruesome injury, but he did take, it took him a good year. To come yeah. back. Now in my mind, I'm like, you know, he's back. He's never going to be the player he was. He's a support role on a, you know, streaky defense for what we thought it was going to be because yep. it was such young guys. It's been better than we expected. And so Kevin Miller was kind of put on a pedestal because we were like, oh, like a veteran. Thank God. Yeah. He wasn't like, if it were a normal defense, we'd be like, whatever, put him on, you know, put him toward the bottom rotation. It's fine. Like, thank God. Like, congrats your back yeah uh, which is kind of what happened to alex smith he was the third string and then everybody just got hurt slash cut and he mm-hmm. ended up on a pedestal yes well part of me is like kevin miller's hurt again so like you made your comeback play through the season but you know i don't need you to keep <laughs> keep trying buddy like don't hurt yourself any more than you already are mm-hmm. uh, like i don't know when he's gonna draw the line Basically. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good uh, question there. But one difference I think is that where Alex Smith feels like he wasn't really wanted back, I think Kevin Miller was extremely wanted back. Like for them to give him a contract or re-sign him the first day of free agency, despite him barely having played in the past two years, I think that was the Bruins saying like, "We really hope you're okay, and we really want you back in this lineup." Where. He, I think he's a big piece from a leadership standpoint and a toughness standpoint. Because when you look at that Bruins D with Chara gone, they don't have that guy that's going to really rough up the opponent when they, you know, slash Tuka Rask or when they, you know, start something after the whistle. Miller was the one who stepped in at the beginning of the season on Miles Wood after Wood ran Rask over a couple of times. Boston outside of him doesn't really have that big tough guy back there. So I feel like he does have a significant role on this team, but now he's hurt again. And you're like, Oh, like I'm hoping that this is just kind of like a day to day thing and he's going to be back. But if this is, if this becomes another reoccurring issue, I think at the end of this year, you're probably looking at Miller probably retiring. Well, he also has a significant relationship with Brad Martian. And I think even Mm -hmm. though, the NBA, it's a lot more important, you know, maintaining those locker room dynamics. I know that there are a lot of players that probably should be traded in the NBA and they're not just because mm-hmm. they're very close friends with ex teammate. Yep. Uh, and I don't know. I don't think Brad Martian's going to go anywhere anytime soon. Uh, barring the fact that there's bias because he's my favorite player, but <laughs> very close with Kevin Miller. And I, I don't know what, you know, those dynamics would have been if they treated him worse understanding the fact that Brad Marchand and Kevin Miller are about to release a hunting TV show together. They have mm-hmm. a small business together. They do a lot with um, real tech. I think is the business. I don't hunt. I think that's the business. Yeah. Um, yep. They have a lot of off ice relationships as well. And as you know, Brad Marchand is turning in from, or, you know, moving from the pest role to the leadership role. It might've, you know, caused a bit of friction in that regard from the front office to say, you know, we're going to, cut the cord here. Um, not that I, like you said, obviously the Bruins are run significantly better than the Washington football team. Yes, yes. 
concern, but moving forward, it's something to look at, especially as their off ice uh, business and PR really does ramp up. I, I'm excited to see, although again, I don't hunt, um, how this kind of ramps up on TV. It'll be something I can watch as quarantine continues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's an interesting thing because Miller and Marshand are like best friends. And um, that's something that uh, that probably does play a role. And I think for Kevin Miller, he doesn't want to play anywhere else. He went to the University of Vermont. He yeah. signed with the Bruins, I believe, as an undrafted free agent after college, mm -hmm. played in Providence, has been a Bruin his entire career. Like it's either Boston or retirement, I think, for Kevin Miller. And I think, you know, obviously he's trying to continue his career. He's trying to keep keep it going as best as he can. But I don't really see him signing with any other team. Um, and I think a good thing for him, and we t this is something that, you know, happens with um, – uh, throughout the throughout the NHL is a lot of players have trouble with post playing days like having something to do and like just knowing what what to do with life when they're done with hockey I think that transition is really hard for a lot of players the fact that Miller is you know has these things with Martian and has this business and you know has this TV show coming out I think that might make it a little bit easier to say, you know, all right, I've played in the NHL. I've done everything that I can. Um, I, I've done, you know, I, I've tried to be, you know, the best defenseman that I could be for a long time now. And now the injuries have taken their toll. But at least he has something to go to when his hockey career is over, which might make it a little bit easier for him to say, you know, this, this, is, uh, this is probably it for me because of these injuries that keep adding up. Yeah, and I completely support him retiring after this year. I think he did a really good job transitioning between Chara and, you know, McAvoy and Carlo, like we said. Mm -hmm. And he really was a good uh, – I, I hate to keep using the word gel, but he did a really good job helping them gel this mm -hmm. roster as it stands now, even if he is injured for the long term, even though I don't know. It might just be day-to-day. -day. We might be yeah. a small proportion. Yeah, but, I just – Hypothetical. I, I saw on Twitter that his knee didn't feel great after skating yeah. the other day, and that makes me think like this could be a reoccurring problem. And if he's still having knee issues, I mean, after two surgeries, then it's probably time to hang him up pretty soon. Like just for the sake of him, like his yeah. life moving yeah. forward. <laughs> yeah, his long term health. Like you want to still be able to walk when you're 50 years old. Like let's not completely destroy your knee here, which I mean, he's already come pretty close. So hopefully it's not a long-term thing. I mean, I love Kevin Miller. I want to see him back in the lineup last week on the show. Uh, when I had my friend Matt on, we were, we were talking about kind of like um, we, we did a, a part where we were talking about who would be your seventh player award winner right now, if the season ended and Kevin Miller was both of our selections, like he would be our seventh player guy. Cause who would have expected him to come back and be as good as he was, but now he's injured again. And I just hope it's not something serious, but if it is Miller's got to be thinking about hanging him up here. Cause you don't want to really, you know, hamper your long-term health with all of these knee problems, but the injury bug, obviously hitting the Bruins, Andre Kosh is still out, which I honestly forgot he was even still on the team. That had not crossed my mind in a couple weeks. <laughs> yeah, I forgot he was still on the team. Um, he doesn't. He hasn't been doing a whole lot when he was in the lineup. Then he got concussed again. And there's another guy that I know he's still young. He wants an NHL career. He wants to play hockey. But this is, I think, concussion three or four for Kasha already. And at this point, it's like, you know, how many times are you going to be able to keep coming back before you know this becomes a uh, I mean, it's already a reoccurring problem, but before this becomes a Mark Savard type situation where the rest of your life is messed up because of it. Yeah, there's got to be, I don't know the NHL uh, like concussion policy as much as I do the NFL's concussion policy, but there's got to be a formal threshold where they're like one more hit man and you're like, you're, you're finished. Yeah, I don't know at what point doctors would stop clearing him to play, but I mean, I know he's had multiple concussions already and another one this season. And you feel for the kid because he's only, I think he's only 24 or, uh, and he's already had multiple concussions like that. It's like, oh no, like this isn't going well long term. And right. uh, he's been out for, he's been out for a while now. And obviously, you know, they're taking this, they're very, being very cautious. They're taking it very slowly. He's not going to come back until he is like 
symptom free, 100% good to go, probably for uh, multiple weeks before they let him come back. Um, I don't know if he's still experiencing symptoms, experiencing symptoms or whatnot, but I don't even think he's skated yet. So it, uh, that looks like it's going to be a pretty long-term injury. And he's another guy out of the middle of that lineup that was supposed to be an offensive threat who's now missing significant time. So Bruins do have a lot of guys out here, but I think they, they're they showing at least so far that they do have the depth to to overcome that. And they're still winning games. I mean, they're still a first place team with 11 wins, despite all of these guys being out of the lineup. I think that's a really good sign for this team moving forward. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think the Bruins have always been injury prone and they show it in the playoffs when they, when they really get hit with the injuries and it doesn't phase them too much. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I never get too concerned about injuries until, you know, the top line or a goalie is affected. Yep. Um, but, you know, we'll keep watching it. I, I am also not, obviously, a lot of these guys are getting called up from Providence, so I am less, you know, well-versed yeah. <laughs> in how much of an impact they're going to have long-term uh, mm-hmm. because we're getting to know them, quite frankly. Um, I can't gauge how much of an impact they're going to have just from, what, the third of the season that we've played. So yeah. um, time will tell, honestly. Yeah, for sure. I don't. I mean, again, I don't know if they're going to be able to keep this up long term with all of these young guys, but hopefully they can. And hopefully uh, some of these guys start coming back. I know um, Zaboral is supposed to come back tonight on for this Islanders game. So that will be big to get him back in the lineup. Grizzlick hopefully will be back soon. He's had a tough year. I mean, it's one injury after the other. And this was such a big year for Grizzlick. Since the playoffs last year, he mm-hmm. was, he's been just hit and hit and hit. Yeah. And this was supposed to be such a big year for Matt Grizzlick. Like they gave him the four year deal. Krug and Char were both gone. So Grizzlick was supposed to step up and kind of take over a huge top four role with this team. And he hasn't been able to stay in the lineup, which is really tough for him. Hopefully when he comes back, he's able to, you know, stay healthy the rest of the way. Cause that's a big loss off of your blue line. That's a guy that is, you know, important to the power play important to you as far as puck moving goes and kind of getting some offense generated from the back end. Um, the, the Bruins are a better team with Grizzlick in the lineup and him being injured this much is not a good sign. Yeah. I mean, he was supposed to take over, you know, that crew role. Yeah. That's why a lot of people, I mean, they were upset to see crew go obviously, but the mm-hmm. fact that we had a prospect that really showed those same skills yep. wasn't that significant of a concern until he, you know, is in and out and in and out. And you can't blame the guy. It's the same as Kasha. Like he did, he's not out there trying to get hurt. Yeah, no, it's not his fault. It's just it just it sucks. It yeah. sucks. It sucks for us. It sucks for him. And I mean, the good news is that he's. I think he's you know on track to come back. Yeah, he's. I believe he's skating now, so yeah, he should yeah. be back somewhat fairly quickly. Hopefully, within the next week or so, Grizzlet comes back into the lineup. But the injury bugs hitting hard, but Boston's overcome it so far. So. Looking ahead now, I want to talk a little bit, preview the week ahead for the for the uh, for the Bruins as they finally have a week where they have a significant number of games. Lately, it's been like a couple games this week, then a long break, then a couple more games, and then a long break. Now they're actually they've got four games uh, coming up. So they have tonight, Thursday against the New York Islanders. This game will have already happened by the time the show drops on Friday. Um, but the Isles, they have uh, had the Bruins number so far this year. Uh, they've beaten the Bruins both times they've played. I th- really hope Boston can get a win in this game because I think they need one against New York. Because um, you don't want, again, you don't want it to be like the Bruins Flyers situation where the F- Bruins have beaten the Flyers every single time. There's five wins now. And like it starts to feel like they're in the heads of the Flyers. I don't want the Islanders in the heads of the Bruins because if we play them come playoff time, <laughs> that would not be good. Um, so just uh, your thoughts on tonight's game against the Isles, and do you think the Bruins can pull this one out finally? God, they better. I hate the Islanders. Like, I <laughs> rational hatred. I just – I can't stand them. And I – it grinds my gears that they can't – the Islanders are overrated. We were on – my co-host Megan and I were on a worldwide sports radio network uh, live show a few weeks ago, and mm. one of their hosts was an Islanders fan. And he was like – we made it all the way through the Eastern conference in the bubble last season. I was like, that was a fluke. And then I checked the standings 
yesterday. And I was like, the Islanders are where? Like, are you kidding me right now that they can't, we can't, no one can stop them? Like, they're not that good. They're over, they've got great goaltending, which pisses me off because Semyon Varlamov is a snake. But, you know, like, I, it's one of those like we were talking about that they're they're not that great. The Bruins should not have this many problems with them. And like you said, if we go over to the playoffs and have to do this Eastern Com- uh yeah, Eastern Conference uh round robin divisional whatever the setup that they're calling it is. Yeah, we- one one four. So if the Islanders finish fourth and the Bruins finish one, they would play in the first round. Right, which would be awful. We would not <laughs> that series. <laughs> like, that would be a tough one. We would not win that series if it's the the Flyers were fine, were yep. great. but like, it's not going to be great if it's the Islanders. So I think, especially coming off of the confidence from Lake Tahoe, they've got to win this game. It's really important going into a, a busier stretch for the next coming week. I yeah. really want to rest from these four days off. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's just the Islanders are one of those sneaky teams that just find ways to win. It's because of their defensive structure. Barry Trotz, I think, is the best coach in the league. Um, And he just his teams always have that lockdown defense that just wins games that they shouldn't be winning. And I mean, they've got some talent in that on that roster. But overall, could not uh, enough to be as good as they are. No, they shouldn't be as good as they are. But I think the goaltending in that you know structure really kind of makes them better than what they should be, and they just find ways to win. But I think the Bruins are going to win tonight. Um, I think they know that they really need to win against the Isles, and I I am a uh, I'm a believer in Boston coming off of that big win at Lake Tahoe. I think they're going to carry some momentum into this game, and that they're going to win tonight and finally beat New York, who they haven't yet. So it's going to be a big one for sure. And then speaking of New York, they go to the other New York team for Friday and Sunday. And this is uh, this is going to be an interesting series. So the Rangers and Bruins have played twice so far this season. They already absolutely hate each other. They were two of the most physical games this season. Um, Bruins did win both games, but only by one goal. I feel like the Rangers are a team, the Bruins. Didn't it? Or overtime? Uh, yeah, I think it was three, two in overtime the first time. And then they won one, nothing in the second game. I feel like it's a team that the Bruins should be beating by more than one goal. But again, (laughs) another team that's tough to play against and seems to be giving the Bruins fits at times. And the first game on Friday is the second half of a back-to-back, obviously, because they play the Islanders tonight. Then they play the Rangers tomorrow. Second games and back-to-backs are never good. I almost expect the Bruins to kind of lose that game, but Uh, The Rangers haven't been playing that well lately, so that gives me a little more hope on the Bruins' side. But uh, what do you think about the Rangers' matchup, and do do the Bruins take both of these, or do they take one? What what do you think here? I hope they take one. I mean, like I said before, uh, they've lost Panarin, which is significant to their offense. Um, Like you said, the Rangers have not been playing particularly well. They've done a really great job pushing overtime for quite a few games. Now. Yes. I've not been able to pull out the win in most of them. Yep. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, particularly because the Bruins have a very hard time closing in regulation yeah. that it goes to overtime in at least one of them. Um, but the Bruins have done really well closing out in overtime and shootouts, which is not the character of the Bruins in the past. Yep. So I wouldn't be shocked if at least one of them went to overtime. I would not be shocked if they're tired at the start of the Friday game, um, especially because they're used to having all of this time off. Yeah. Going into a back-to-back, which I don't even know the last time they had a back-to-back. Two weeks ago? Like three weeks? Yeah, it's been at least two weeks. Yes, which is – so they're not going to be used to that at all. Um, One other thing that we didn't speak about going into tonight's game is that they are coming back from traveling from the West Coast, which they have done all year because yep. they've been playing teams on the east coast so they're at a disadvantage that the flyers are the only other team that will have had that um and i believe the flyers also play for the first time tonight i don't think they have played they like, played last night and they beat the rangers yeah okay they played and they won so that's that's good omen i guess they came back from the west and they still won so yeah i didn't even think about the time change because n- well, the Canadian teams di- do have to deal with time changes because they're going all across Canada. But in the East Division, every team's in the Eastern time zone. So they're not used to having to change times. And um, 
they, this is, you know, obviously now coming back from Nevada, they have gone from West coast to East coast. So um, that's an interesting thing. I wonder if they're, they're going to be, now they have had three days off. So hopefully, you know, whatever jet lag is worn off by now uh, or any sort of effects on them is worn off by now, but that is interesting that, you know, I didn't even think of that, that they have it's to deal with the time. Trip that they're not used to, you know, the farthest yeah. one that they're probably doing is uh, what, New York, the Devils are they the farthest south? Yeah, Devil or Wa- Washington maybe. Yeah, Washington's probably Washington's the probably the further south they go. The furthest it's west they go. Flight. I can I can attest that it's an hour <laughs> flight or an eight hour drive, so it's really not that bad. For them. Yeah, the furthest west they go, I think, is okay. Pittsburgh. The Sabers is probably. Oh yeah, Buffalo. We haven't gone there yet, but they will be going to Buffalo. That's a decent trip. Pittsburgh's a pretty. Western Pennsylvania is a pretty big trip, but they're not traveling. Like they're not going down to Tampa Bay. They're not going out to play the California teams. Like Washington to Boston, Washington to Pittsburgh is all eight hours in a triangle. So that's yeah. not bad. I, I can't say I've ever been to Buffalo. So I don't <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about Buffalo, but the travel this year is not bad except for this one trip out West. So it is something different that they're going to have to deal with that they're not used to this year. The other thing is that the Sunday game for the rain against the Rangers is a noontime start. So I feel like everyone's going to be asleep for the first period. Like that, that those early, early starts like that are usually, kind of slow at the beginning before everyone kind of gets their legs under them. So, uh, you know, that will be interesting to see how they play in that one with such an early start time. Especially because with COVID protocol, they're not allowed to show up any earlier than not. I think it's 90 minutes before the game starts. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they basically just go right on. They get, they get there, get dressed and go right on the and ice. Go, yep. There's no pep talk. There's nothing, no pregame, nothing. Yeah. Um, so if you're pretty much at home, just like, waking up and driving straight there um there's like you, you probably are gonna be asleep i would i'd probably just wake right up <laughs> yeah yeah that's gonna be interesting how that goes with such an early start time and then on wednesday they play the capitals so they get monday and tuesday off after you know a pretty busy end of the week but then wednesday they come back and they have the washington capitals and washington's been an interesting team this year like I feel like there's more in that team. Like they haven't played to their potential yet, but they've had some really good showings. And then there's been some other games. You're just like, what are they doing? Particularly last weekend when they lost four to one to the Rangers, I was like, what Capitals team is this? Like, where did they, where, why are they playing this bad? And then they've been overall kind of poor in afternoon games in general this year for Washington. But this is a night game. It's Wednesday night. Going to be a tough one. The Caps always play the Bruins tough. Um, I'd like to think that the Bruins can win that considering the last time that they played, they came back from three goals down to win the game. Um, but uh, Washington always seems to be one of those teams that plays really tough against Boston. Yeah. My struggle is that the caps, I don't even know if it's that they're not playing to their potential or the way we think about their potential is different because they've aged. So like mm-hmm. their roster has not changed, but the age of their roster has yep. gotten older. So they are, by far the oldest team in the league yeah. prior to getting Chara, um, except for their goaltending, which is both under 25. Yeah. Um, and they're both playing what Vanishak was a complete surprise when Samsonov went out, Yeah, um, which has been really great for them. However, the rest of their roster is playing sl- absolutely sluggish and old. Mm-hmm. So it's really great opportunity for the young Bruins to not get intimidated by Chara or Ovechkin or any of these old men on the ice and skate around them in circles because they're playing incredibly slow. However, the Bruins, for some reason, the five years I've lived in D.C., the Bruins, for whatever reason, cannot come. To, I don't know if the game's in Washington or Boston, but they cannot come to Washington and win a game because they get like in their head and overwhelmed and they lose every single time they come to Washington for whatever reason yeah. this year because i obviously haven't been to the game but like I, it's like an enigma they can't cut the anytime it's like even before chara was here they can't beat them and then this year they've played okay against mm-hmm. the capitals um but i don't know i mean i hope they can pull it up because it'll really especially if they take any bad losses against the new york teams yeah. um it'll be able to build the momentum back up and i think part of the reason that 
the Capitals have looked kind of rough in the past few days is they have played the Penguins like 20 times. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I think they have five games already against Pittsburgh completed, and they're playing again tonight. So that's six. Which is insane. And they don't like each other. They're rivals. Uh, they're mm -hmm. both pretty equal in terms of skill caliber. So if, mm -hmm. if we were playing – you know, a high potential team over and over and over, it would wear us down too. Yeah, for sure. And it's, well, yeah, Washington and Pittsburgh at, tonight will have played six times already, which means they only play twice the whole rest of the season. So they've played a lot early in the year, and then they're not going to see each other much until uh, only a couple more times the rest of the year. So that's when they're probably matched. Up. Yeah, they're going to, we know that they're going to match up in the playoffs. That's just going to be the way it works. It's going to be like two, that's going to be like the two, three matchup or something. It's going to be, it's going to be uh, uh, the the Penguins and Caps again. And it's going to be like, oh, here, another chapter in the great history of Crosby versus Ovechkin. <laughs> but hopefully Boston's in the one spot and won't have to worry about either of them until, uh, until, uh, de uh, the second round or deeper into the playoffs. But yeah. big week coming up here for the Bruins. Islanders, uh, I think that, that Wednesday-Washington game is at home because they have another New York trip uh, tonight and Friday and Saturday on the road. Then they come back home and they play the Washington. Uh, uh, they play the Capitals on Wednesday and Friday of next week um, at home. They haven't played a lot of uh, games at TD Garden here recently. There's not. They've been on the road a lot. This has been a road heavy stretch for the Bruins but so far they've been able to pull it off but big week ahead for sure and I'm definitely looking forward to uh, hopefully the Bruins coming away with the uh, with some wins here uh, against some pretty difficult opponents that usually play them well but that's going to bring us now to our final segment this was a segment I put in a couple weeks ago it's just for fun it's Bruins bet of the week it hasn't gone well so far though my pick from last week uh, was Bruins uh, to beat the Islanders tonight. So we don't know how that game's gone yet. Maybe I'll be right about it. But first week did not go well. I took Bruins and uh, Islanders under, and they ended up having six goals in the game, hit the over. I screwed that. So Bruins bet of the week uh, can be just to win the game, could be an over-under pick on total goals scored. Um, mo most of these games I think will probably be five and a half over-unders. Um, Islanders probably, I would think would be, uh, Rangers definitely probably five and a half capitals. They might bump to six, but probably five and a half either way, any bet this week with these upcoming games, Bruins to win Bruins to score, you know, whatever, anything you got, do you, is there anything that looks like an absolute lock to you? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that. I had trouble with this. Be, I had trouble coming up with mine because nothing looks like a lock to me. No, I mean, I'm trying to learn more about, I have not ever made a sports bet besides putting money on my fantasy leagues. Um, and <laughs> Smart, you just lose, <laughs> lose, lose. <laughs> and Belly Up Sports is getting more into sports betting because we have a new uh, sports betting sponsor. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to learn more about it, but I really would like to have more comprehensive understanding before I put any money into Oh, <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, I'm not doing well here recently. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so if I say the they say five and a half, that means to, total goal score. In, in the game, yes. So if I say over, it's going to be more. Yeah, if you bet an over, then you would need at least six goals scored in the game for you to win the bet. Yeah, so I would say that I, I'm reasonably comfortable with over on the Caps Bruins game. Okay. All right, so I'm I'm going to assume that that's we obviously odds are now at, yet for that because that's not till when, uh, next Wednesday. But I would say it's probably going to be five and a half. So you're going to go over on that one. Um, yeah. Bruins generally are a lower scoring team, obviously not Sunday, but a lot of their lines over the course of this year have been five and a half over unders. So uh, over five and a half Washington on Wednesday. I that's probably a pretty good one. Um, I might, I might take that. That that's a pretty good one. Um, we could see definitely see some goals scored between those two teams. My bet of the week this week comes from the Sunday game against the New York Rangers, and I'm taking under five and a half in that game because we talked about this earlier. Noon time start. I am fully expecting these teams to be asleep at the wheel at least for the first period of this game. I might take that bet. That might be. Maybe <laughs> <bet>. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely thinking it's going to be under five and a half. The Bruins and Rangers have played the uh, have gone under five and a half 
both times that they've played so far. First game was 3-2, five goals. Uh, second game was one nothing, so way under. Um, goaltenders are playing well. I mean, I don't know who's going to play Sunday, if it's going to be Halak or Rask, but honestly, I'm comfortable with either of them. They're both playing pretty well. Uh, I assume Shesterkin is probably going to be in goal for the Rangers. And if that's the case, he's been playing great recently. Um, even Georgiev, you know, pretty solid, especially in his last start. So I'm comfortable taking the under no matter who's in goal with these two teams. The noontime start is really what makes me like it, though, because I don't think there might be no goals in like entirely in that first period. Like that might be zero zero going into the second. So uh, I'm liking under five and a half there. So that's going to be my Bruins bet of the week. But we'll see if I'm right or not. I haven't done well betting so far this season. The last the last couple weeks have been really rough. I was off to a deep three two for Lake Tahoe, and that just yeah was did not. <laughs> did not happen. Uh, it's, it's been a rough, uh, rough go the last couple of weeks, but we'll get, hopefully break out of a slump and maybe this Bruins bet will help. So anyway, guys, that's going to bring us to the end of our show here. Episode nine of black and gold weekly. Shannon, thank you so much for coming on again. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, great to have you on for sure. Yeah. Thanks again. It's always fun. Happy to jump on anytime. We always appreciate you hopping on our live streams at Slapshot Sweethearts as well. Yeah, of course. Anytime. It's always a good time for sure. Having some fun in the chat on there. But uh, Shannon from Slapshot Sweethearts, if you haven't followed, subscribed and uh, everything, I don't know, is there anything else you can do other than follow and subscribe, but like uh, all of that stuff. Slapshot Sweethearts, YouTube, Twitter, uh, all your podcast platforms like Spotify, Apple, all of that. Um, they have a f- putting out consistent, phenomenal content. They're doing live streams on YouTube now, which are awesome. Always a fun time. I hop on there sometimes uh, as well. And uh, a lot of great people in the chats of those. So definitely you're going to want to follow Slapshot Sweethearts anywhere that you can find them. And I uh, want to thank Mark Allred and everyone from Black and Gold Productions for you know putting this show on and allowing this to happen. Uh, this show is through them, and uh, it's, uh, they're an absolutely awesome group. And also check out blackandgoldhockey.com. That is the website that goes along with everything at Black and Gold Productions. And um, we have an amazing team of writers there who are consistently putting out phenomenal Bruins articles each and every day. Um, so check them out as well. And uh, again, don't forget the links down in the description uh, if you're looking for Bruins apparel, NHL apparel, or NCAA college apparel. And uh, thank you all so much for watching all the audience here watching and listening. Really, really appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, You guys are a big part in the reason that this show is going on as well. So um, thank you guys so much. Definitely talk to you soon. See you next week for episode 10. I can't believe we'll be at double digit episodes already next week, but uh, that's going to do it for this one. Thank you guys so much and have a great day.